It's been a nightmare day on the finance. The government has been... Markets will go into free fall again, they're plunged across the world. In 2008, here on Wall Street, something went wrong that almost brought down capitalism. And the aftershocks are still being felt today. Is it the worst you've ever seen in your career? Oh, by far. Our government is broke. Disappointed by the outcome. But I assure our citizens around the world... This is not the end. The end, the end this the end. really was the catastrophe that we had thought was too big to think about. People had money thrown at them in circumstances where they could never repay the loans. It was clearly this human factor that that was going to cause stampeding. It was like a horror movie. We need help. But it didn't end as you walked out the door. Predator's going to be a victim of predatory lending. Real people would get hurt. It was an era-defining global catastrophe, and it threatened to sink our economy. This exocet comes along. Uh, it's called the global financial crisis. And it's heading amidships. Uh, frankly, um, frightened the hell out of me. But something remarkable happened. Australia sailed through the biggest crisis in the history of the world since the Depression without losing any skin. I was having a discussion with the US Treasury Secretary and I said, by the way, in Australia, not one of the banks made one loss for one quarter. He said, say that again. We're not used to being told we're special, but we did make global economic history as the last rich nation standing. The Australian model and what's occurred here is a particularly, um, particularly good story. You wouldn't frame it this way, you know, with a flag sticking out of the back of your head, but anyway. I'm George Megalogenis. I've been an author and journalist for nearly 30 years, a decade of which was spent in the parliamentary press gallery, a ringside seat from which to observe leadership, nonsense and drivel, and the blood sport of politics. I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I want to explore the data and relive the events that changed us as a nation. Don't worry, I'm steering the economy. <laughs> I want to talk to the decision makers. Well, the technician has carved the letters GST into your gold crown, and he's stuck it up there. The first thing that struck me about it was how fat Sinatra was. He must have worn corsets on stage. I said, really? I said, you'd have to be a mug to fall for that story, you know? I want to delve into our cultural memory. Australia too has won the American Cup. There's 20 years of a love of Barossa Shiraz between that event and now, so... <laughs> I want to look again at the stories we've been telling ourselves about Australia's place in the world. We'd balanced about seven budgets before the mining boom even appeared. Is our apparent overnight success just a fleeting moment in time? Or the result of forces unleashed decades ago, or even longer? Just on now, a quarter of a century of unbroken growth. I want to go beyond the fog of politics to see Australia as it really is and ask the most important question of all. Can we make something of this moment? This is my journey into the past, present and future. Are we in danger of becoming a great nation? Let's face it, we've always been pretty well off, but I want to find out if our 21st century winning streak is something more than just good old fashioned Aussie luck. The story of our longest boom begins in another land, in the blue collar paradise of the Menzies era. The great Australian dream was a car, a house in the suburbs and a job for life. You could live this way on Dad's income alone, although Mum might have had other ideas. 
Dennis is an electronics man. The city calls on electronics to help with its traffic problems. These old films seem a little surreal. I prefer to look at the numbers behind these images, and I've discovered a fascinating record of just how easy we had it. Well, this is the Australian 1969. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bit fragile. Yep. Yeah. In all my time in journalism, I don't think I've seen a headline that tells a story more brilliantly than this. The date, Tuesday, October the 14th, 1969. More jobs than workers. Unemployment falls to 41,121. Vacancies rise to 46,736. There are more jobs on offer than people looking for them. Job is an important one. There were no Sunday newspapers. That was a good thing in my view. Society got destroyed when Sunday newspapers came. There was no current affairs on television. We weren't allowed to have current affairs on television on a Sunday. That was all, uh, all regulated and uh, everybody worked there nine to five or seven to four, Monday to Friday and went to the football on Saturday and church on Sunday. I remember our local parish priest took all the altar boys when I was one to see Roman Holiday with Gregory Peck and um, Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> These were big events. The old economy, like the society it served, was sheltered. The worst thing about the closed model was that the price of all of our goods was set by officials. The old economic model in Australia was built on a fixed exchange rate. It was built on centralised wage fixing. And it was also built on protection for um, Australian industry with high tariffs. So we had all of this on the cabinet table. In other words, the place was locked up. Um, and we had this sort of complacent, smug, uncompetitive banking system to go with it where there was a ceiling on not only what banks could offer for deposits, but also a ceiling on what they could charge for money they lent. Our national body clock seemed to be frozen in the 1950s. The Liberals ruled for more than 20 uninterrupted years. Robert Menzies was Prime Minister for 16 of those, and he made governing appear effortless. Every member of both parties entirely supports the action of the government in this matter. Menzies wasn't bothered by economics because the economy rarely bothered politicians in his day. <laughs> when the people finally grew tired of the Conservatives in 1972, they switched to Labor on the assumption that the good times would last forever. It's time. Mr Gough Whitlam. However, Gough Whitlam had picked the worst possible time to introduce his expensive social reforms. We will abolish fees at university, raising all pensions, Commonwealth spending on schools and teacher training, universal health insurance, we build our existing cities and to build new ones. We had an antiquated system of economic control, one that had sort of worked reasonably well during the 50s and 60s, the period of post-war reconstruction, but came under increasing pressure in the 70s. Gough Whitlam based his huge expenditure program on the assumption that economic growth would continue to deliver huge tax revenues to fund it. Now, that all fell apart in the early 70s. He was quite unlucky. I mean. Had he won in 69, he would have had a better, a way better opportunity. Our program's ambitious. It should be so, because the backlog is so great. And we cannot expect to clear away that backlog in three months or even three years. We came to the, the 70s unprepared um, for meeting the new situation. We were in new territory and we weren't ready for it. 
the world economic order was breaking down. The problem was inflation, and it began in the US, which was funding the Vietnam War by printing money. The Arab-Israeli conflict in 1973 then brought a new player to the table, the oil-producing nations of the Middle East. Angry at US support for Israel, they suspended exports to the Americans, increased the price of oil across the board, and helped trigger a deep global recession. We had the quadrupling of oil prices. The paradigm that had operated in the 50s and 60s was gone forever, and we were living in an entirely new world. As the buffeting comes along from these international influences with inflation, and particularly after the first OPEC oil shock, um, and the wages claims that accompanied it, uh, essentially blew to pieces the whole economic framework. Instability would become the new normal. External shocks would test our leaders, our institutions, our very temperament as a nation, again and again. So far, we're off to a lousy start. Gough Whitlam saw no reason to moderate his spending program. Basically, Gough was frightened of economics. I said, Gough, I know you're going to do some great things, but our government will live or die on what you do in the economic field. I said, let me organise some economists from the ANU. I said, you get the, get the basics. He said, yeah, good idea, comrade, because um, he never, never would do it. He didn't have any idea of economics. If he had a great idea, which was going to cost something, well, then the cost would look after itself. While the government tried to satisfy glaring social needs in health, universality, access and equity in aged care and education, the whole economic framework within which this was to be delivered just as simply exploded. I was at the OECD in Paris, but my memory of that is that Australia was looked upon as sort of one of the juvenile delinquents of the world because of its poor economic performance in the 70s. The golden age was coming to an end. Australia had been blessed with low and stable unemployment for decades, even through Whitlam's first term. But as the global recession reached our shores in the winter of 1974, our luck finally ran out. Unemployment almost doubled in the next six months, from 2.1% to an unthinkable 4%. A job for life was now a phrase for the history books. The recession bamboozled the re-elected Whitlam government. The spending program was dialed up to stimulate the economy, but unemployment kept climbing. Well, this is a problem of the Labor Party, really, in the post-war years. The Labor Party in the post-war years fundamentally believed that the public sector could be the primary provider of goods and services and wealth, but there wasn't a commitment to the private sector. They saw the government rowing the boat rather than steering the boat. Something else didn't add up. When unemployment rose, inflation did not come down, as the old economic theory said it should. A new word was needed to describe this malaise. Stagflation. It bewildered a lot of people. And in the nature of things, somebody else was to blame. It was you know, the wealthy people or the unions or somebody else. Pass it on down the line, mate. Pass it on down the line. If you can't see the light, don't get up, mate. Just pass it on down. Australia had one of the worst bouts of stagflation in the world, compounded by an aggressive trade union movement. The unions thought they were protecting their members when they asked for more money. But the excessive wage claims cost workers their jobs. We're opposed to this uh, people being scabs on the black band. Yeah, there's a black band on work on this side, is there? There's a black band all over this area. 1974 was a record year for strike action, and the most unexpected characters were caught in the shutdown. Can we speak to you, Mr. Sinatra? Yeah, we're around the corner, no man. It's been a persistent pursuit. 
We've been having a marvelous time being chased around the country for the three days. You'd think a man like that in the public eye so much would find five minutes of his time to talk to his millions and millions of fans. Rightly so, he just wants his privacy. Book into his hotel with his friend to bring The dispute erupted on the Melbourne leg of Frank Sinatra's tour in July that year and climaxed in the presidential suite of Sydney's Boulevard Hotel. John Pond, the hotel's PR manager at the time, was an eyewitness to the siege. He said, I love coming to Australia, I love Australians, but the members of the press, they're just a, a bunch of parasites. Say they're bums and they're always going to be bums, every one of them. And of course, then he said, and the female members of the press. The broads who work in the press are the hookers of the press. Are just a bunch of dollar fifty hookers. I might offer them a buck and a half, I'm not sure. The next day, headlines in papers all over Australia. Our union just won't tolerate it happening to our members and that's the end of it. We're going to ban him. There'll be no concert tonight in Melbourne, but the TWU is to be approached to stop Sinatra's plane leaving. He came back to Sydney under a, a, a false name on a commercial flight. He came back to the hotel, the phone rings, it's the Prime Minister for John Pond. And he said, basically, John, there's not much I can do. He said, uh, there's only one guy that can get you out of this fix. Well, are we ready now? Bob Hawke, then President of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, was called in to broker a peace deal. The first thing that struck me about it was how fat Sinatra was. He must have worn corsets on stage. Because there he was, just bulging tummy. Frank was up the back and I was talking to the lawyer. The lawyer said uh, to me, he said, you can't uh, stop uh, Mr Sinatra leaving Australia. I said, well, there's, in recorded history, there's only one person that I know who's been said to have walked on water. Unless Frank has developed that skill, uh, members of my affiliated unions uh, determine whether the ship will leave or the plane will leave. Frank came over. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a union man. And I said, well, I'm glad to hear that, uh, Frank. Uh, I said, I haven't got anything against you, but your chapter behaved in an unacceptable way. So Frank and I just sorted it out. It was words to effect. Mr Sinatra is deeply sorry for any inconvenient, you know, it was one of those wishy-washy sort of sort of statements. And everyone said, yeah, that, that's close enough. Let's give him every break in the book, folks, OK? Frank? By this time, it's like 10 o'clock at night. Mr Hawke said to me, ring up ants at John and tell them to hold the last flight. <laughs> and I said, oh, they won't do that, Mr Hawke. He said, yes, they will. <laughs> tell them it's for me. <laughs> And it was resolved. Bob, Bob was a lar the larrikin leader. He was, and uh, and he got a kind of a he got away with the larrikinism by being the good guy who settled disputes. You know, when he had the ACTU, I mean, mind you, he created most of them, but then he settled his own disputes. You know what I mean? The unions weren't the only ones issuing ransom demands. Business held the economy hostage under the tariff system, which shielded them from foreign competition through punitive taxes on imports. It was called tailor-made protection. The, the tariff board and the government would work out how much protection you needed to survive, and you would get that uh, protection. If your costs were 30% higher than the rest of the world, you got a 30% tariff. And if your costs were 50% higher, you got a 50% tariff. Protection was a joint venture between government, business and unions dating back to the early years of Federation. We have to have some form of protection to um, protect the standard living of the people that work here. The theory was that tariffs would nurture new industries while maintaining high wages for workers. If you took the continent of Australia and put a glass bell jar over it and a tube up to Great Britain, in the tube went the wool, the wheat and the gold under British imperial preference and inside the bell jar we, we kept out imports, uh, competitively priced labour, and of course, with white Australia, yellow people. Um, and the country went around on that, 
on that model for really 80 years. The problem by the 1970s was that we were making things that were overpriced and under par. The Leyland P76 was greeted with rave reviews. It was Judge Wheels magazine car of the year in 1973. And what a car. What can you tell us about the P76? Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's one hell of a revolutionary car. You'll see for yourself soon enough. They sold it as anything but average. But it became the punchline to a national joke. Leyland P76, you are the very pits and I dislike you. Doors wouldn't open, windows wouldn't seal, and bits would fly off, including dashboard switches, window wipers, even the automatic gear shift could come off in your hand. Production was terminated in 1974 after just 17,000 vehicles. Leyland closed its Sydney manufacturing plant, throwing 5,000 workers onto the dole. But the car itself has had the last laugh. It is now a collector's item. When somebody made a negative comment, I would say, have you driven one? Oh, no, if I haven't sat in one, I haven't driven one. You've never owned one then. No, don't need to say any more, just walk away. Oh, well, let's give this one a whirl. Give it a go. Well, I'll rip our son. After I figure out how to uh, let this handbrake down. Pull it, pull it up, put the button in. There we are. The P76, an unfortunate symbol of a broken economic model. Can we talk into joining our club? <laughs> <laughs> Goff Whitlam called the P76 a dud. Perhaps he understood a little more about the false economy of protection than politics gives him credit. He often remarked to me after he ceased being Prime Minister that, that he, he thought the manufacturing lobby had got too much with high tariffs. The Whitlam legacy, social reform, political chaos, big collars and bad hair. But something else was happening. Across his desk as Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam was receiving briefing notes about inflation, rising inflation. So he decided with the stroke of a Prime Ministerial pen in July of 1973 to knock inflation on the head with a 25% cut in tariffs. This was supposed to garner the approval of of people who were looking for a more open economy and a more competitive one. It just came from nowhere, in no framework, and of course said nothing about, about the model Australia should be working in. Either way, Whitlam had broken the seal on the old model, but his timing was as bad as the P76. He cut tariffs just before the oil shock and the lethal combination of rising wages and prices sent many sheltered businesses to the wall. When you look back at it, the 25% tariff cut uh, was understandable, but the problem was without really preparing the electorate or providing an explanation, he probably set back the cause of lower tariffs. Although Whitlam was a victim of economic circumstance, there was no excusing the political chaos on his watch. This is one of the most revealing monuments of the Whitlam era. 27 ministers sat around this purpose-built table. And the cabinet room became the setting for a soap opera. The interesting thing, when I first arrived, no one said a word to me. So you sort of sheepishly walked into this cabinet room where 27 of them were seated. I went to sit in the only vacant chair, which was Connor's chair. So I said, and God said, don't sit there. And so I said, well, where do I sit? Uh, uh, he said, Bowen, you sit there. So Bowen got up and said, so I, I walked round in the Bowen seat. They said, no, no, you don't sit there either. No, no, you go there. And this is a square table, <laughs> mind you. <laughs> I mean, I said to Goff, Goff, I'm happy for a seat anywhere. Up the back will do me. The ministers at the table pursued their own agendas when the government could least afford them. 
Minerals and Energy Minister Rex Connor had a dream to turn Australia into an energy superpower. Connor went looking for the money to pay for the infrastructure from unconventional sources, independent of the Treasury. Mr Kamalani, were you asked to appear before the Senate today before you... Mr Kamalani... A shadowy figure called Tiras Kamalani promised Connor he could raise a multi-billion dollar loan on favourable terms from the oil-rich Middle East. Rex didn't believe in the Cabinet process of funding these things appropriately through the budget and through the market and wanted to own them, another problem, and having that funded how, by, how you know, that you know some capital inflow out of the that. Middle East, you know, it was just so unnecessary. Unnecessary, ill-disciplined and unnecessary. The Treasury leaked against the government and Gough Whitlam eventually called a halt to the loan scheme without any funds being raised. But his minister never gave up the search. Rex Connor didn't know when to stop. Night after night, he waited in his office for the telex that never came. His press secretary and I, Bob Sorby, used to say to him, Rex, for God's sake, leave the telex machine alone. Did you tell him uh, once famously, this is no way for a minister to behave? Yeah, I did. I said, you know, this is not how a cabinet should operate, Rex. This is not, not the way it should be, you know. He said, you're young and impressionable. <laughs> the scandal should have been put to bed in the winter of 1975. But when more telexes were uncovered, the opposition used its newly acquired numbers in the Senate to block Labor's most responsible budget. Can you tell us anything about your meeting with the Governor-General? No, no, I couldn't on other occasions and I can't on this occasion. Is your stand still firm about blocking supply? Of course it is. Did he give you any if Rex Connor had borrowed the money through regular channels, would you have supported the venture? If he'd been able to, um, we would have no reason, no substantive reason for opposing it. When Gough Whitlam was faced with an obstructionist Senate in 1974, he called an early election which he won. This time, he dug in. We will not yield to blackmail. We will not be panicked. We will not turn over the government of this country. The business of government will go on. I suppose the miscalculation I made was that, you know, I thought Gough would do the conventional thing. The conventional thing, when you can't get your budget through the parliament, is to recommend that somebody else form a government or that there be an election. Gough Whitlam owned this chamber in the 1960s. He'd seen off Prime Ministers Gorton and McMahon and wiped the floor of opposition leader Billy Snedden. But now he would face the most ambitious liberal politician of his generation. The tussle between these two giants would spill out onto the steps of this very Parliament House with a dismissal and then out onto the streets. The angriest election campaign in living memory. But voters endorsed Labor's sacking with a landslide election win for the Coalition. I congratulate the Liberal and National Country parties on winning the elections and winning them convincingly. The nightmare of the Whitlam years was over. The grown-ups were back in office and our economy was supposed to return to normal with the sound management of Fraserism. Every Prime Minister wants to correct for the flaw of their predecessor. Gough Whitlam led a chaotic government. Malcolm Fraser's was going to be in control. Malcolm Fraser was a micromanager. He worked his cabinet hard. Ministers would often come to his office expecting a yes, but coming away with a no. Fraser was, was, was no better. He, he had no real understanding of economics either. University campus to the Supreme Court. Stagflation became entrenched and Hawke's union movement continually pushed management for self-defeating wage increases. OK, OK, so we got our freedom. But management's lousing up everything. Bob never likes me saying, but he was... Uh the pyromaniac who nearly lit the economy up twice. Labour is at fault. It's ruining the country. I didn't see how to get a deal with him there that would stick and that would be responsible. And maybe I should have. Maybe we should have had a, a general meeting. My constituents 
as your elected representative, I can assure you Labour's right, management's right. I'm strictly neutral. I, as president, I said to you, I, pl I pleaded with him I, uh, that the, the confrontation we were having uh, between capital and Labour uh, was not good. Let's sit down and get some sort of negotiation and agreement between us, but he, he wouldn't have a bar of that. There hadn't been uh, a consensus reached as to how the nation should respond. We were still debating at a political level how to respond in the old terms. At a time where the changing world demanded good economic leadership, we were lacking in this country. The Whitlam spending program became Fraser's and it was left to a rookie treasurer, the nation's eighth in eight years, to try to sort out the mess. I certainly didn't expect to become treasurer late in 1977. It was uh, quite a wild ride. The tax cuts Malcolm Fraser promised in the 1977 election were snatched back the following year. I knew from very early on that the first budget I would bring down in 1978 would have to be a real stinker uh, if we were to have any chance of uh, uh, cutting the deficit. Well, uh, you didn't go high last, like this last week, did you? What will the point of your budget basically well, it'll, be? Well, it'll, it'll be a responsible, realistic budget. That's what all treasurers say. They all say it's going to be responsible and well, realistic. Uh, of course they do. Treasury advised us the economy had had too many shocks. I did not want to get another big shock. We had to start cutting back expenditure and reduce expectations, but to do it with a sense of gradualness. But once you've been going six months, your predecessors' programs become the programs of their successor, or in other words, of my ministers. Mm. And it's much, much harder to cut expenditure the longer you go on. Fraser didn't calm Australia down. In fact, we became angrier as the 1970s dragged on. And it was reflected in a more aggressive popular culture. Thousands of people in here and the soggy and there's lots of beer and you, you can't ask for any more. <laughs> Rock music became overtly political and Peter Garrett was one of the leaders of this new wave. We were so excited, but you came and went so soon. Oh, I think I was concerned at the way in which I thought um, the Conservatives had essentially trashed the sort of acceptance doctrines around, um, you know, rule of law and parliamentary politics through the dismissal. And I, you know, I mean, Gough said maintain the rage, and I did. Australia led the world in economic decline, so it was only appropriate that we would write the soundtrack for this grumpy age. Incredibly, Australia delivers the first punk single ever. Look, it was fractious, but I also think it was interesting because the, the, the sort of animal spirits of uh, civilians had been opened up by the Whitlam period earlier on. So, of course, you know, punk and, and new wave are, are just starting to bubble up on the streets. A lot of young people at that stage were just seeing what was effectively a repeat silent movie. Fraser is still in the lecture theatre. and there's a It was the same story that was being told. And so they wanted to listen to people that were telling a different story, but at the same time they wanted to enjoy themselves, as Aussies do. The top end of town played up as well and turned tax avoidance into a national pastime. People were pushed into higher tax brackets and they naturally scouted around, uh, you know, not very honourably, I might say, for um, uh, ways of uh, minimising their tax, and uh, I thought that was uh, outrageous and uh, I won myself a lot of enemies, I guess, in fighting it. It was quite a, an acrimonious period. While Australians fiddled their tax returns, the Americans decided to tackle stagflation.
Jimmy Carter appointed economist Paul Volcker as chairman of the US Federal Reserve in 1979 as the second of the oil shocks was underway following the revolution in Iran. Volcker had a radical plan, kill inflation at the expense of jobs. The inflation had gotten bad enough and upset people enough in their mood that they were willing to, uh, to see it through. In 1980, Volcker pushed interest rates beyond 20%. In 1981, with a new president in the White House, he did it again. President Reagan, uh, I don't know if he clenched his teeth or whatever, but he uh, was willing to see it through. Inflation collapsed from a high of almost 15% to 2.5%. But two million jobs had been sacrificed. Remember what an enemy inflation used to be? It was murderous. Interest rates got far higher than I had imagined or anybody imagined for a while. And we went through a very tough period. America was now in recession. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Australia, the Right Honourable Malcolm Fraser. In those days, a US recession led inevitably to a recession here. But Malcolm Fraser didn't see this one coming. At the 1980 election, he morphed into Rex Connor, promising his own resources boom. More than $6,000 million was invested in mining and manufacturing. And now prospective investment is $29 billion. The trade unions asked for more money, and Fraser let them have it. But the boom never materialised, and when the Volcker shock reached our shores in 1982, it caused a recession even more damaging than the one that had helped bring down Gough Whitlam's government. Any lingering attachment either side of politics had to the old regulated model was gone. That just re revealed to us how fragile the position was, and then before long we were faced with a very big recession, which uh, ended in uh, uh, double-digit unemployment. The Whitlam recession had pushed unemployment beyond 5%. But the Fraser recession took it over 10%, a figure not seen since the 1930s. And inflation was back in double digits. Lee Kuan Yew, Prime Minister of Singapore, three years before 1980, he said his exact words, if Australia keeps going the way it is, it will finish up the poor white trash of Asia. And that was not an overstatement. The 70s serve as a warning of what we do to ourselves when things go wrong, when complacency turns to conflict. We don't want another crack up because it may take 10 years to diagnose the problem before we even decide to do something about it. At the end of the Whitlam Fraser decade, Australia had run out of excuses. Fraser's government refused to let go of the old broken levers of economic control, even though it was advised to do so. John Howard had established an inquiry into the financial system as long ago as 1978. The review was chaired by a highly regarded son of a bricklayer and company director, Keith Campbell. But no one in the coalition was prepared to argue for the key finding, to set the currency free. Campbell had three major recommendations. Uh, float the dollar and remove exchange controls, let in foreign banks and remove government intervention in the market, uh, i.e. controls over interest rates and the like. And as far as the float was concerned, there was no constituency in the Fraser government for floating the dollar. Is that a lasting regret of your Prime Ministership, that you don't have that particular reform uh, with your name on it? Well, we should have. There were a number of letters I wrote saying, why is this taking so long? Why did it take so long to get it established after Cameron had made a decision to have it? Treasury opposed it every foot of the way. They dragged their heels every foot of the way. And when we got the report, they didn't particularly want to implement it. Fraser had exhausted the country without reforming the economy. In 1983, he tried to catch Labor with its pants down by calling an early election. I recommended to His Excellency that there should be a double dissolution of the Parliament. That has been agreed. 
the election will be on the 5th of March. But Labor switched leaders that morning, with the respected but not popular Bill Hayden standing aside for a charismatic but temperamental ex-union leader. The next Prime Minister of Australia, Bob Hawke. Like Gough Whitlam, Bob Hawke ran on a program of spending. Reductions in income to 100% retention of profit, $24 million over three years, $20 million extra for Reduce child. the price of petrol, a grant of $5,000. There will be no new capital gains tax. Well, it was all labour. I mean, the 83 policy speech that Bob gave was, a, was, was hopeless. It was a shopping list about how we would expand the public sector because we need to have a big, bigger budget deficit. He's heading at this stage because, of course, everybody wants to talk with him. Certainly and I would like to thank all my colleagues and the Liberal Party right around the country for the support they've given, not just over recent weeks, but over the last seven years. Bob Hawke had famously quit drinking to convince the nation he was ready to lead. Oh, I'm going to really let my hair down and have a, as I say, a double dash of lime in the mineral water. <laughs> the morning after his election win, he faced a different kind of hangover. On the Sunday, John Stone, then the Secretary of the Treasury, came to see me and revealed that uh, my good friend Johnny Howard hadn't been quite as open <laughs> with the election as he might have been in terms of the size of the deficit I was going to inherit. We are, as a government, I believe, going to change the face uh, of decision-making in this country. We are going to open up uh, the processes uh, of government. No government in future will ever get as big a shock as Bob, Bob Hawke got in, uh, in 83. The advice from the Secretary of the Treasury on the Sunday after the election was that the budget would be 4.6% of GDP. In today's dollars, that would be about $75 billion and uh, way beyond anything that had been uh, anticipated. People often say, oh, well, Paul was a bit nervous when he took the job. By God, you need to be on Valium not to be nervous. I mean, the place was nuts, you know? And, and, and you knew you were it. You can't say, oh, it's, it's the next guy. There is no next guy. The estimate for 83, 84, would not be the $6 billion that they were talking about in the campaign, but a figure of $9.6 billion. Hawke knew he had no hope of meeting his election promises and, mindful of the blunders of the Whitlam era, ditched his program straight away. People were running around trying to support a bigger budget deficit, but uh, Bob's instincts on this were good. The first thing Bob Hawke does as Prime Minister in this Parliament is throw it open to the people. One month after his election win, he invites business, unions, charities, experts in every field, state and local governments for a national economic summit to bring the nation back together after the division of the Fraser years. What Mr Hawke has done is he's got a group of outsiders, very much an elite group. He's brought them together in the Parliament, a place none of them have ever sat before, and they've definitely got something to say. I want to assure you that we permanent residents don't normally eat in the way in which you've been eating in the last four days. Hawke is making the point that Labor, the working man's party, is now going to be best mates with business. I was able to get a unanimous, apart from Joe Jockey Peterson, a unanimous communique from that vast summit authorising, giving me the authority to go ahead and do the sorts of things that I did. Then these past four days will indeed prove to be a turning point in the conduct and in the character of the affairs and the concerns of this great nation of ours. Now, that's the essence, I think, of, of of good economic management. And it's not bloody rocket science. This Labor regime had another thing going for it. The global economy, which had cursed the Whitlam and Fraser governments, had just entered a new, more productive phase. The post-war long wave of growth runs from 1947 to 1974. And 
the next long wave runs from 1982 to 2007. When Bob Hawke and I are elected Prime Minister and Treasurer, we are not really aware that the beginning of the new tech wave had started in 1982. Suddenly, a rich man's sport was uniting the nation. Got the America's Cup. Jeez, you mob should have elected me years ago. Tell you what, it's enough to get a bloke back on the old amber fluid. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> yeah, winning the uh, America's Cup, um, it wasn't just the fact of doing something that had never been done before. Ceiling victory. It showed uh, that in the area of technology, we can take on, you know, the biggest, most technologically advanced country in the world and beat them. I was actually there, and we end up on Alan Bond's tender boat. We followed Australia too up in the tacking duel uh, with the American boat, and then of course Australia too won. So it was a, it was a great moment, you know. Yeah, there are as excited as we are. <laughs> well, look, it's just one of the greatest moments in Australian sporting history. It is. For a country which was just starting to believe in itself again uh, uh, in '83, it really did give us a boost. Figure three shows um, an end-on view. We beat the Yanks with the rule-bending wing keel, and we told ourselves that we could make things again. There was a downside to the new Australian cockiness. Money was now flooding back into the country, but the fixed exchange rate system couldn't cope. We had uh, this crazy business of uh, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department, and the Governor of the Reserve Bank sitting down every now and again and deciding what the exchange rate would be. Uh, this is crazy. The old managed system of the exchange rate worked while ever the authorities had the upper hand, while ever speculators in the market thought the authorities could out-speculate them, out-bid them and control them. But once a group of speculators takes that authority on and beats it, and they did with us, forcing us into a 10% depreciation on the first day of the government, once you get a big discreet movement, your cover is blown. The confidence that you can continue to go back to running a little small discreet movement's exchange rate is finished. Hawke and Keating had decided early on to set the currency free but they would bide their time until they could do it on the government's terms and not on the markets. The first public hint of Labor's free market revolution had come in April, when the Treasurer convinced his colleagues to revive the Fraser government's neglected Campbell report. This baby step would make a float of the dollar inevitable. Prime Minister said as much today. Within three weeks of us taking office, not three months, three weeks, I gave an interview to Ross Gittins in the Sydney Morning Herald wherein I say, I think it would be a mistake to let the Campbell report simply collect dust on the shelf. Three months after the high of the America's Cup win, the moment came. On Thursday, December the 8th, the Reserve Bank's office in New York called to say that another wave of money was on its way, ready to buy up Australian dollars. The particular trigger uh, for the float was the, uh, the build-up of capital inflow on a very large scale uh, in December uh, uh, on a Thursday night, the Thursday night in which uh, there was the annual uh, uh, press party for, for the end of the uh, parliamentary year. The coincidence of boozing journos and international finance was somehow appropriate. The largest chunk of money coming into Australia that week was earmarked for the grog economy, as John Elliott, a Melbourne-based corporate raider, was launching a takeover bid for Carlton and United breweries. And of course, last week's champion, John Elliott. <laughs> if the exchange rate originator gets a shock, the shock goes through the domestic monetary structure, pushing up interest rates generally. So everything spoke of the need to move the exchange, for the exchange rate to be able to move in a, a supple kind of way. While the press gallery partied through the night, Hawke and Keating and their advisers took the bold step to close the foreign exchange market on the Friday 
so Cabinet could thrash out the reform. Now I knew immediately that meant they were going to float. It was only a matter of time. But the bureaucrat who held the lever, Treasury Secretary John Stone, was not ready to let go. He said to me as he came past, he said, Prime Minister, you'll live to regret this decision. <laughs> we had two and a half billion in nine days, which would have added about 3% of the money supply. Now that was the conditions we faced when we decided that was it, enough was enough, we we're actually going to float. Uh, the decision to float means that the speculators will now be speculating against themselves. Were you nervous on that, especially when the, when the market was reopened on the Monday? Were you nervous that no, the dollar might go into a tailspin? I was not nervous. Or... I mean, once you know a decision is the right thing, you go ahead. Because there's always going to be some you know, bits of a rough ride here and there, but you've got to make the right decision. In fact, the float was deemed an instant success because nothing much happened. The currency didn't surge or crash. All right, now let's go forward. Uh, uh, which way have you got a pointing? Which is front? Here was a Labor government, headed by a union man, embracing the free market, and a Prime Minister arm in arm with his Treasurer. <laughs> we tend to think of Prime Minister and Treasurer as mortal enemies, forever at each other's throats. But in the early 80s, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating struck up a new kind of relationship for a Prime Minister and Treasurer. They were like father and son, and there was a lot of love in this room as they were remaking Australia. Have a, and Mrs. Died. Have a <laughs> we got on we got on really well. And essentially it's a it's a friendship for the first couple. It becomes a rivalry after that, but that's Oh no, it's it's not just a first couple, it's a friendship for a very long time, really. Floating the dollar turned Australian politics on its head. John Howard didn't argue for the float as treasurer in Malcolm Fraser's government. Now he was cheering Labour on from opposition. We handled it very well, and one of the reasons we handled it very well was that it had bipartisan support. To be fair to John, uh, you know, we appreciated the fact uh, that he didn't oppose because the sorts of things we, we were doing, I think a lot of, not all of them, but uh, many of the things he was doing, he would have liked to have done when he was treasurer. But he didn't have a prime minister who uh, was in the field, basically. Between them, Hawke and Keating let go of the four key levers in the economy. After floating the dollar, they allowed foreign banks into Australia and let the market set all interest rates, including those for housing. And in the 90s, they tore down the tariff wall and Keating as Prime Minister dumped Labor's century-long commitment to centralised wage fixing. See, there was fundamentally no disagreement about the broad model between the coalition parties and the Labor Party. They all believed in the bell jar. They believed in the closed model of Australia. When I became treasurer, I had to decide whether to, to be a participant in the scam or to blow the scam up. It is interesting to me that we have all these people competing to say that they were the father of this wonderful, fantastic Australian initiative. But no one asked the other question. The real question is, why were we 10 years later than everyone else? That is a good question. In the 70s, there was no trust in the system. Neither side of politics trusted the market and the bureaucracy didn't trust the governments it served. Everybody dug in. But after a few heady years of reform, we suddenly felt rich again. With the global economy now delivering sustained growth, the 1980s became our decade to party. I think I started to notice a change in values and business behaviour in the 80s. And the trigger point for me was when one of the magazines started publishing a rich list. And you could sort of feel a sort of get-rich-quick mentality developing. <laughs> The open economy was there for the taking, and we invented a new kind of hero, the entrepreneur. They were sort of Gatsby-like figures, weren't they? Uh, but I think it gave a signal to the public, things are not bad, you know? Instead of being the dull old place we used to be, we've actually got a few stars.
the most outlandish was Christopher Scase. At the peak of his financial fame, he owned the Seven Network, the then Brisbane Bears footy club, and was pursuing Hollywood's MGM studios. In 1988, Scase unveiled the jewel in his crown, the first five-star resort to be built in Queensland's tropical north. The Mirage transformed Port Douglas from a sleepy seaside town into a playground for the rich. Skates' meticulous Sheraton Mirage town. Don't worry, I'm steering the economy. <laughs> it's actually all over the place, like the economy. <laughs> Local resident Doug Ryan was there to witness the champagne economy. I've got to let you know. Look, it was opulent, there was no doubt about it. Every visitor you had in the town, you took there. I remember one particular event we had here, it was a yachting event, and it was non-stop cases of cases of Verve champagne for everyone. And everyone was walking around with a bottle of Verve in each hand, you know, and they gave up using glasses because it was easy to drink out of the bottle. This was a new Australia, without the insecurities of the 50s and 60s or the resentments of the 70s. We had learnt to let go. You'd almost be prepared to believe that God was an Australian, I guess. Even Frank Sinatra was back, back playing for a million dollar fee to the new A-list. He sent me a you know, personal invitation to, to be his guest at his concert. We celebrated the 200th anniversary of European settlement in 1988 and we were sure we had finally arrived in the world. But we were playing with Mirage money. Our bicentennial boom was about to turn to bust. But I knew we had a problem. Endless stories of heartbreak. I thought to myself, oh, what if they go down and our money goes down with it, and then we go down? We were about to learn a new set of lessons about greed and fear. Where should we draw the line between market and government, between new and old Australia? This is a recession that Australia had to have. The next two decades would reveal a different side to our personality as we shaped a unique model that could handle anything the world threw at us. I'm sorry about that, but there is no other way. There is no other way. The late in the night when the lights are all out, she slips off her stockings and shoes. She makes you her lover and lets you discover the smile she keeps, she keeps for you. She keeps no, she keeps no, she keeps no secrets from you. She keeps no, she keeps no.